Hello, good morning, and welcome to An Academy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. Let's get started with the analysis of today's the Hindu newspaper. These are the topics that we have picked up today from the international edition of the Hindu newspaper. But before we start, an important announcement, and listen to me carefully. When we launched our online classroom program in February this year. We launched another batch, then another batch is coming up on the 6th of April. We received a lot of comments from the students saying that your live classroom program is unaffordable. Although we consider that ours is the most affordable program in the industry, because our look at the other institutes, how much they charge in multiple lakhs. Yes, there are institutes which charge less than us, but you can also look at the quality. And I would say this with authority that they compromise on the quality while we do not. And you can go through and compare the quality of the English classes on all the platforms. But even then, this term affordability is subjective. What is affordable to you may not be affordable to me and vice versa. That is why there is an opportunity for those who consider our programs unaffordable. What you can do, you can take a mega UCSC test, an Academy Civil Services Championship test on 7th of April. There are two slots available, 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. 50 questions in one hour, and these questions have been designed by your teachers, and you can get up to 90% scholarship on our live online classroom program you can also win other rewards worth 40 crore rupees. That's an important announcement. Please register for the scholarship test. It's free registration available. The link is provided in the comment section. Now let's get started and look at article number one from the international edition of the Hindu newspaper. And this is in continuation to the discussion we had yesterday. But I will briefly summarize this issue for you and then we will try and understand this editorial and another newspaper article in today's The Hindu Newspaper. Kachathivu. In Tamil, it stands for barren. Kachathivu Island, it is a 285-acre tiny island which is northwest of Jaffna. It is an inhabited area the only place which you can find here is St. Anthony's Church. Why is it uninhabited area? Because there is no source of drinking water at this place. It was considered that this Kachathivu Island is part of the Jaffna Kingdom. It was argued that Kachathivu is the product of the volcanic eruptions in the 14th century. And then in 17th century, it was under the Jaffna kingdom. Although there are some scholars which dispute this claim. For example, some scholars said that Mr. Colin Campbell, who was the governor of Ceylon, because Sri Lanka then was called Ceylon in 1845, he issued three notifications demarcating the area of or the boundaries of Jaffna. And none of these notifications mentioned Kachathivu. So it was not part of the Jaffna kingdom. There are others who say that it was part of Madras presidency. It was part of initially Ramnad dynasty. It was under the Maharaja and then became part of the Madras presidency. But the year was 1921 when we witnessed dispute on Kachathivu between India and Ceylon, the current day Sri Lanka. Both were the British colonies. And the citizens of both these British colonies, they wanted access to Kachathivu for fishing expeditions. And ultimately, this dispute could not be resolved. And it could be resolved only in 1974, when Srimati Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister, and this Kachathivu island was given to Sri Lanka. But because of this agreement, it was also decided that Indian fishermen can visit the St. Anthony's Church without visa. They should also be involved in the 
fishing expeditions surrounding Kachathivu Island. But Sri Lanka said no, that is not part of the compromise, that is not part of the agreement. What is part of the agreement is that Indian fishermen can rest at Kachathivu. What Indian fishermen can do, they can dry their fishing nets at Kachathivu. And what Indians can do, they can visit this St. Anthony's church without a visa. Two years later, during emergency in 1976, another agreement was signed between the two countries where it was decided that India and Sri Lanka, we will restrict our fishing within our exclusive economic zone. Because Indian fishermen entering the Sri Lankan waters, Sri Lankan fishermen entering the Indian waters, this has always been a bone of contention between the two countries. And in 1976, it was decided that we will restrict our fishing to each to our exclusive economic zone. But this Kachathivu Island, it falls at the edge of both the countries' exclusive economic zone. So that means on Kachathivu, there was no clarity regarding fishing. But the government of India at that point in time thought that there is no strategic value to Kachathivu. When there is no strategic value, if we give it to Sri Lanka, it will normalize, stabilize and harmonize relations between the two countries. But then the Tamil Nadu political parties, whether it is the DMK or the AIDMK or others, they always ask for retrieval of Kachathivu Island. And this has become a domestic political issue in, Sri Lanka, in, in, in Tamil Nadu for a long time. But now Prime Minister has waded into this issue. Yesterday or day before yesterday on X, which was formerly Twitter, he quoted a newspaper report and said Congress had callously gifted Kachathivu to Sri Lanka. On foreign policy matters, on important matters concerning friendly relations with foreign countries, there has to be continuity. Continuity in the sense, and there was continuity. For example, in 2022, the External Affairs Ministry informed Rajya Sabha that Kachathivu lies on the Sri Lankan side of India-Sri Lanka International Maritime Boundary Line. And this line was created in 1974 agreement. So there was continuity, which means the government, the present day government, speaks of Kachathivu lying on the Sri Lankan side, which means it is part of Sri Lanka. In fact, there was a petition filed in the Supreme Court. Initially, a petition was filed during emergency in the Delhi High Court as well, saying government of India cannot gift a part of our territory to another country. Because we discussed yesterday, that there was a case, Berubari Union, where Supreme Court had said, you can gift a part of your territory, but for that a constitutional amendment act is required under Article 368. The government, in response to that petition, said that no constitutional amendment act was required because no Indian territory was gifted or ceded to another country, which means they have accepted that Kachathivu was never part of India. So there was no question of India giving up its territory to another country requiring constitutional amendment. Constitutional amendment was required when India-Bangladesh boundary agreement was finalized, where 111 enclaves were given by India to Bangladesh and 51 enclaves were given by Bangladesh to India. So there was an exchange of territory between the two countries that required a constitutional amendment, 100th Constitutional Amendment Act 2015. Can tomorrow, if their government changes, reverse its policy on India-Bangladesh land boundary agreement? Will it not affect India's relationship with the neighbors? And at the same time, a little after Mr. Modi became the Prime Minister, an MEA affidavit in the Madras High Court, Ministry of External Affairs affidavit in the Madras High Court said, Kacha Thivu is a settled matter. That means it has now been settled. And former Attorney General, Mr. Mukul Rohadgi, he told the Supreme Court that through an agreement, 
Kacha Thibu is part of Sri Lanka. And if we want to take it back, we have to resort to a war. Various experts who have served as foreign secretaries, ambassadors to Sri Lanka, they are cautioning government on Kacha Thibu. Saying if it has now been settled that it is part of Sri Lanka, that it has been given to Sri Lanka, although there have been reports suggesting that it was always part of Sri Lanka, reports that it was always part of Sri Lanka. So when it has been settled, successive governments will have to honor the commitments made by the previous government. If we don't do that, then it will affect India's credibility in the world. Former Foreign Secretary Nirupama Menon Rai, she has said that what happens in India, in Tamil Nadu politics, is watched very closely by Sri Lanka. So if there are statements given by local Tamil leaders belonging to regional political parties, that's okay. But with Prime Minister joining the bandwagon, it sends a signal that perhaps this is the policy of the government of India. That means there are constitutional experts, there are foreign affairs experts who now say that because of External Affairs Minister Mr. S. J. Shankar also talking about this issue, Prime Minister also raising this issue. It may be viewed that there is a reversal of stand on Kacha Thivu. That means initially our stand was that this matter has now been settled. Initially our stand was that this is a land, this is a territory which belongs to Sri Lanka. And now there seems to be reversal of our position on Kacha Thivu which does not augur well for India's credibility in the international sphere. Why? Because then who would trust today's government or tomorrow's government while they are negotiating deals and pacts with foreign countries saying you are not to be trusted because tomorrow if the government changes, the new government will not honor the treaties and deals of the previous government. That is why this editorial also says, those in power should not rake up issues that affect India's ties with neighbors. And look at this, something very important. It's understandable if political leaders in Tamil Nadu raise the demand of Kacha Thivu's retrieval every now and then. But it would be extremely disturbing if the Prime Minister too joins the bandwagon. Why? Because it will then give a sense that there is a reversal of stand of the government of India, which will affect India's relationship with the foreign countries. That's topic number one. Topic number two, Supreme Court notice to Election Commission of India on plea to check EVM VVPAT counts. Initially, voting used to take place through ballot papers, but then EVMs were introduced. Some facts, EVM was first introduced in a Paravarur, in a by-election to Paravarur constituency in Kerala. This was declared invalid. This election was declared invalid. Why? Because the Representation of the People Act explicitly spoke of elections through ballot papers. Later on, this law was amended and now elections were made possible through electronic voting machines. Electronic voting machines, we have a control unit we have a ballot unit. This control unit is with the presiding officer. As soon as I press the start button, you can enter as a voter to the voting compartment, press the button on an electronic voting machine and your vote is cast. EVMs, despite the allegation that EVMs are hacked or can be hacked, I am here to tell you EVMs cannot be hacked. Why? Because what is hacking? I am using a phone this phone, you can remotely operate. How? Because this phone is connected to the internet and you can access this phone remotely through the internet because there is a transmitter, there is a receiver. An electronic voting machine does not have a transmitter. It does not have a receiver. That means it cannot be connected to the internet, which means it cannot be remotely operated upon, which means EVMs cannot be hacked. EVMs are like calculators. Have you ever heard somebody telling you my calculator has been hacked? Yes, your phone can be hacked because it's connected to the net. Your computers, your laptops can be hacked because they are connected to the internet. But calculators, 
because they are not connected to the internet, there is no transmitter, there is no receiver, they cannot be hacked. Similarly, EVMs cannot be hacked. But there is one problem. And what is that problem? Netherlands spent millions of pounds on developing EVMs, but then they shelved the project. UK also shelved this project. United States, some states use EVMs, others do not. Germany declared, the German court declared EVMs as unconstitutional. What is so special about Indian EVMs that we continue to use them? While as the technologically advanced countries, they have shelved the idea of electronic voting machines and they go and opt for ballot papers instead. It's because Indian EVMs are not connected to the internet. It is because EVMs cannot be remotely operated. EVMs cannot be hacked according to the traditional definition of hacking. But there is one problem and that problem is with the transparency. Or should we say there was one problem and that problem dealt with transparency. For example, when I press the button on the electronic voting machine, the vote is cast. I don't know whether my vote has been indeed registered in favor of the political party of my choice or not, in favor of the candidate of my choice or not. Because no matter what voting system you use, any voting system, whether it is ballot paper or EVM or any system, it must meet four important characteristics. Characteristic number one, speed. Your voting system should be able to produce quick results. You should be able to vote in a shortest possible time frame. For example, you see a long queue outside the polling booth. You may not want to go out and vote. Why? Because this queue will never end. So under the scorching heat, why would I suffer? According to Indian Meteorological Department, now it's going to be hottest in the upcoming months when we are supposed to vote. Will that affect the voting percentage? That remains to be seen. That is why any voting system should meet one characteristic, which is speed. The other characteristic, anonymity. Nobody should come to know who I voted for. Otherwise, I will be liable for mistreatment. Those who would know that I voted for some other candidate, they would start penalizing me punishing me for my behavior, for exercising my right. Not just that, it should be scalable as well. That means any voting system that we use should be able to cater to wider population, massive population such as India. But the last important point is it has to be accurate. That means if I'm voting for candidate A, it must be indeed registered for candidate A. But through EVMs, I would not come to know because I am only voting. I do not get the picture of whether this vote has been registered in favor of the candidate of my choice or not. This is where the year was 2011, 2013 at Noxon Parliamentary Constituency in Nagaland. For the first time, VVPAT was used. And what is this VVPAT? Voter Verifiable paper audit trail, which means this is your voting unit, this is your control unit, this is your VVPAT, it's like a printer. What it will do, as soon as you press the button on the electronic voting machine, for 7 seconds, some information will be displayed. What is that information? What is the serial number of your vote? What is the name and the symbol of the candidate you have voted for? That will be displayed for seven seconds. After that, it will be cut and it will drop in the ballot box. But then, votes from the VVPAT slips and votes from the EVMs, they are to be matched. That is how we can be safely assured that there is absolute accuracy with the electronic voting machines that we use and Chandrababu Naidu. The year was 2019. He approached the Supreme Court. Dear Supreme Court, I have a writ petition. I said, why? Sir, right now, Election Commission of India, what it does, it randomly picks a VVPAT 
it randomly picks an EVM and then matches the EVM and the VVPAT count. That's it. So then what do you want? Sir, we want, right now it is one machine for every assembly constituency. in a parliamentary constituency. What are you saying? Sir, according to Election Commission of India, if this is a parliamentary constituency, this parliamentary constituency will have multiple assembly constituencies as well. So what Election Commission of India does, from one assembly constituency, it will pick randomly one EVM and match it with the VVPAT slips. We want this number 1 to be enhanced to 5. That means instead of verifying one EVM for every assembly constituency in a parliamentary constituency, what Election Commission of India should do? It should verify, it should pick up 5 EVMs per assembly constituency in a parliamentary constituency and match with VVPAT. And after that, since 2019, we have been doing this for five assembly constituencies or segments per, per parliamentary constituency. Now there is a petition before the Supreme Court and Supreme Court has now issued notice to Election Commission of India that not five, we need to match every single EVM with the VVPAT. That's number one. Number two, right now what is happening? Once you press the button, the information is displayed and then it gets cut and it drops in the ballot box. The petitioner is asking that what we need to do, the voter should manually take this print out of this VVPAT slip and manually drop in the ballot box. That will bring confidence. If this is allowed, it will further strengthen people's trust on this entire electoral process. Whether this will happen or not, we have to wait and watch. That is for the Supreme Court to decide. But Supreme Court in 2019 enhanced from one machine to five machines. And it can also enhance from five machines to all the machines as well. Related to this for your mains examination, you should also look at maybe a question can be asked. On electoral reforms, Name the electoral reforms and their impact which have emerged out of judicial decisions. For example, a judicial decision once was taken that nota should be an option provided on electronic voting machine. That is an electoral reform but mandated by the judiciary. Similarly, all the voters, all the voters had the right to know the antecedents of the candidates contesting election. That's because of the Supreme Court judgment. Voters have the right to know the funding of political parties. That's because of the Supreme Court judgment. Supreme Court has said that every political party which gives tickets to candidates with criminal past, it has to publicly explain why you are giving tickets to these candidates with criminal past. And don't tell us you are giving them tickets because of their winability. You have to tell us the exact reason. And you have to mention the reason prominently on your website and in at least two national newspapers. So there have been various or the biggest electoral reform where in Lily Thomas versus Union of India, the Supreme Court struck down Section 8, Clause 4 of the Representation of the People Act 1951, which means the moment you are convicted by a court of law, you are disqualified. So you may be asked because in line of this VVPAT notice, in light of the electoral bonds judgment, maybe UPSC will ask you to list and analyze the significance and importance of all those electoral reforms which have been implemented because of judiciary through judicial verdicts. Clear? That's for your mains examination. Let's look at topic number three. Can states borrow money? Answer is yes. How much? What is the limit? The limit is 3% of the gross state domestic product. What's the question? Can states borrow money? Yes. How much? 
3% of the gross state domestic product. Who has recommended this? This has come on the recommendations of 15th Finance Commission. Clear? Lockdown was imposed because of COVID-19 pandemic. The central government said, let's increase this limit. We will increase this limit to 5%. That means instead of borrowing up to 3% of the gross state domestic product, you can borrow 5%, which means an increase of 2%. But this 2% increase, you can be eligible if you implement some reforms. What are the reforms? That means all those states can borrow this additional 2% of the gross state domestic product if you implement certain reforms. Which are these reforms? If you implement one nation, one the Russian card. If you implement some of the reforms in the power sector. If you take steps so that the revenue of the urban local bodies is increased, whatever steps you take to increase the revenue of urban local bodies, whatever reforms you take to make power sector more profitable, if you implement one nation, one Russian card, you can borrow 2% additionally on the basis of your gross state domestic product. Clear? But something else. Does that mean that all states will have to take permission from the central government if they have to borrow money? Yes. How? There is something called Article 293 of the Constitution, which says that if there is a state which wants to borrow money, It has to seek the consent of the center. But only and only if the state is indebted to center. There is a state which wants to borrow money. Whether through open market operations or other ways. It wants to borrow money. It has to take the consent of the center. Without center's consent, you cannot borrow this money. And this you have to seek consent of the center. If you are indebted to the center, that means you have a loan, previous loan, which was given to you by the center. Which basically means all the states in India, because all the states in India, at one point or the other, would borrow money from the center, are indebted from the, to the center. That means every state will have to seek the consent of the center in borrowing money. And under Article 293, Clause 4, the center can impose conditions. That is why the center said, based on the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission, that you can take loans or borrow up to 3% of your gross state domestic product. And whenever state is asking the center, seeking the consent of the center that we need to borrow money, the center takes the suggestions of the Finance Commission, which is a constitutional body mandated under Article 280 of the Constitution, set up by the president every five years. And it is this, it is this Finance Commission which talks about the distribution of divisible pool of taxes between the center and the states. But under Article 293, Clause 4, center can impose conditions that you can borrow money, but subject to these conditions. You can borrow additional money, but subject to reforms such as implement one nation, one ration card, power sector reform, so on and so forth. But listen to me carefully. What is Article 293 today? Its origin can be traced to Section 163 of the Government of India Act 1935. Under this section also, if the states wanted to borrow money, they had to seek the consent of the center. 
and under this section also the condition was center will not impose any condition which is unreasonable listen to me carefully that means even under this section the imposition of terms and conditions conditions will not be have to be unreasonable there was a demand in the constituent assembly that now since the colonial government is to be replaced by a democratic government why should state seek the consent of the center and then center will impose some demands conditions on the states instead why can't we have a lone council this is what constituent assembly recommended we should have some this is what one committee of the constituent assembly recommended that we should have a lone council and it is this lone council which should have collectively decided whether the states can borrow money additionally or not and this would have been in the spirit of cooperative federalism this may have been similar to what we have today in the form of gst council and gst council is in the spirit of cooperative federalism because center has one third of the vote in the gst council states have two third of the votes in the gst council center and states coming together that's cooperative federalism but then listen to me carefully public debt of the state in the distribution of powers under schedule 7 of the constitution is under it's under state list why should center interfere and if center can allow states to borrow but by imposing conditions can these conditions be such as you implement police reforms but police is a state subject under the distribution of powers so the question now is can center impose any condition on the state or is there a restriction on the kind and type of conditions that center can impose on the state if there is no limitation then are we a federal polity or are we a unitary polity when it comes to fiscal relations between center and the states financial relations between center and the states that is why there is always a talk of implied limitation what is this implied limitation listen to me carefully very important point when we look at section article 293 of the constitution there is no explicit limitation on the center that these are the conditions which you can't impose on the states there is no such explicit limitation on the center but should there be implied limitation that means although limitation not there but there are some limitations which you can't violate for example nani palki wala before 13 judges of the supreme court in keshavananda bharti case he spoke of something called implied limitation what was the question before the supreme court in keshavananda bharti versus state of kerala is the power of parliament supreme that it can amend any provision of the constitution or is there a restriction limitation on the powers of the parliament in amending the constitution nani palki wala said look at article 368 it does not talk about any restriction but does that mean there are no restrictions on the parliament or are there implied restrictions nani palki wala asked the court my lord if there is no limitation on the powers of the parliament what stops the parliament from saying that from now onwards the term of the lok sabha is not 5 years it is 10 years because it can do anything it can amend the constitution and there is no limitation it can do that what stops a government from amending fundamental right and saying you don't have article 21 is there a limitation explicit limitation on the powers of the parliament in amending the constitution no there is none what stops a government 
from gifting a part of our territory to another country? What stops a government from converting this Republican constitu constitution into a monarchy? What stops this government from gifting this country to another country? May we go back to the colonial times. Can parliament do this? You can't. Why? Although there are no restrictions mentioned in the constitution, but there are implied restrictions. Similarly, when conditions are imposed by the center to the states that you implement these reforms, then you can borrow money. Then you can additionally borrow money. This cannot be unreasonable. There has to be implied restriction, limitation on the center. Kerala government said that in March and August last year, not only did the center impose restriction that you can't borrow more than 3% of your gross state domestic product, but in fact, more limitations were imposed on us, Kerala, that you can't further borrow money. There was a dispute. And under the constitution, whenever there is a dispute between center and the state, the original jurisdiction is with the Supreme Court, where the state can drag the center to the court under Article 131 of the Constitution. The court asked, you have imposed limitations on the states that you can't borrow more than 3%. But on top of that, you have imposed more conditions on Kerala that you can't even borrow from any other source. You can't even borrow from other market, open market operations. Why this special treatment or this differential treatment for Kerala? The government said, look at what Finance Commission has said, because we go by Finance Commission. Finance Commission has designated Kerala as a highly debt stressed state. Speaking volumes about the financial mismanagement of Kerala. Saying what Kerala does, it borrows money. But for what? For day to day operations. If you borrow money, for enhancing the capital infrastructure of your state. That's okay. But you are borrowing money for running day-to-day -day affairs. And you are borrowing this money. And the second highest percentage of its total revenue expenditure is on salaries and pensions. And these salaries and pensions, this expenditure continues to grow. So Kerala is not any other state. It's not just like any other state. It is a highly debt-stressed state. That is why more limitations on Kerala. That is why you can't borrow from any other source. Because first, put your house in order. Kerala says, look at what RBI is saying. RBI is saying that for every 100 rupee in tax which is collected by the center, center assigns on an average 35 rupees to the states. But what we are getting as Kerala, we are getting only 21, which means you are discriminating against us. Not just that, in 2017, you implemented GST, although we agreed. But what was the guarantee? The guarantee was for five years, you will compensate us. You have stopped and paused this GST compensation. In fact, COVID-19 adversely affected our economic strength. And then this compensation would have been provided only for five years, which means it ended in 2022. All these factors, COVID-19, other factors, lack of GST compensation, all this has adversely affected the state's finances and we need to borrow money. Hence, the petition was filed before the Supreme Court under Article 131 of the Constitution, saying either center should allow us to raise this level, that means we should be raising more than what is prescribed based on the recommendations of the Finance Commission, or we should be allowed to borrow more than 20,000 crore from other sources. Matter went to the court and now the Supreme Court has referred this matter to a five judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court. Now a five judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court will hear this matter. And what are the questions that this five judge bench of the Supreme Court will have to grapple with? Number one, federalism is part of the basic structure. Yes, it is. When federalism is part of the basic structure, and this was 
highlighted by the Supreme Court in the SR Bammai case of 1994, where Supreme Court said federalism is part of the basic structure, not just this. If there is a provision in the constitution which affects federalism, listen to me carefully, this provision should be given narrow interpretation. It should not be given wider interpretation. So, what is the difference between the two? Listen to me carefully. Center has to give consent to the state so that the state can borrow money if the state is indebted to the center, but center will impose condition. Whether this condition can be wide that you can impose any condition or this condition can be narrowed in the larger interest of federalism, saying you should not impose conditions which affect the state list in the distribution of powers. That's what S.R. Bamai said in 1994, that federalism is part of the basic structure and any provision, if it affects federalism, has to be given narrow interpretation, not the wider interpretation. And now the question before the court is, that what this five judge bench of the Supreme Court will have to grapple with, is that is fiscal decentralization an important aspect of Indian federalism? And if central agencies are fixing net borrowing ceilings on states, is this violation of federalism? That's question number one. Question number two, if the borrowing restrictions of the center were in conflict with the role assigned to RBI, what is one of the role of the RBI Reserve Bank of India? It is the public debt manager. And here the center is also acting like a public debt manager. That means on the directions of the Finance Commission, it is imposing limitations on the states in terms of their borrowing. So who is public debt manager? Is it center or is it the RBI? Because the role seems to be conflicting. Whether it was mandatory for the center to have prior consultation with states for giving effect to the recommendations of the Finance Commission. This is very, very important. In fact, there is one aspect that whatever award is given by the Finance Commission, that cannot be challenged in any court of law. That cannot be challenged in the Supreme Court. The original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is excluded from the matters related to Finance Commission. But now what Supreme Court has said, whether whatever recommendation is given by Finance Commission, before implementing those recommendations, should center consult the states, and this case, my dear, is going to have far-reaching ramifications on India's federal structure, on federal polity. But at the same time, no interim relief was granted by the Supreme Court to the Kerala government. What is that interim relief? Kerala government wanted that it should either direct the union government, that you should lift this limit of net borrowing, or you should enable the state to borrow 26,226 crore on an immediate basis. Otherwise, we are in a financial mess. We have to pay salaries, pensions to the employees. The court said we can't grant this interim relief. Why? Because this is prima facie, your financial mismanagement. And it will send a wrong signal to other states. You can also flout fiscal discipline and then come to the court and we will allow you to borrow additionally which will violate, which will drain your exchequer, that's something that we will not do. So no immediate relief, but three important questions have been raised by the Supreme Court, which a five-judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court will have to decide. Is that clear? Let's look at another important article. A team of scientists and researchers, they have found strong evidence which indicates the presence of ozone on one of the Jupiter's moon, Callisto. One fact of all the planets in our solar system, which planet has the highest number of moons? Saturn, followed by Jupiter. And at, in one of the moons of Jupiter, Callisto, 
Researchers have found strong evidence, have discovered strong evidence of what? The presence of ozone, which may also talk about or reveal conditions which might favor life on one of the moons of Jupiter. What makes life possible on Earth? What makes life possible on Earth? Radiation of suitable frequency reaching Earth. That is one reason. Water Sunlight reaches us, but the sunlight, it has the right frequency of radiation to reach us. Water is there. We have stable atmosphere. Through the stable atmosphere, what do we get? We get stable gases at the right temperature. All of this makes life possible on this planet, makes life possible on Earth. But listen to me carefully. We have radiation coming from sun. Are all these radiations coming from sun harmful or useful? Some are harmful, some are useful. Clear? But a particular radiation, let's say ultraviolet radiation, it may be harmful to some species, but it may be useful for some species. There are two components of ultraviolet radiation. One is ultraviolet B, ultraviolet C. These radiations, they have the potential to do what? To disturb our DNA. It may lead to mutation. It may lead to cataract in humans it may lead to skin cancer as well. So these UV, B, UVC, these two components of ultraviolet radiations, if they reach Earth, it is going to have huge ramifications on the life as it exists on the planet. And this is what makes ozone so important. It is this ozone layer which traps all these ultraviolet B and C components so that they don't reach the surface of the earth. And that is what makes life possible. Ozone at the same time, it is a blue gas which with pungent smell. But ozone, what is the formula? O3 which means the very presence of ozone on Jupiter's moon Callisto, it might also tell us the existence of oxygen, which may be favorable for the life to make Jupiter or other planets habitable. That is why this discovery of strong evidence indicating the presence of ozone on Jupiter's moon is very, very important. And this is something which has corroborated what Hubble Space Telescope way back in 1997 also suggested. Hubble Space Tele Telescope in 1997 suggested the presence of sulfur dioxide and ozone on the surface of Callisto in 1997. And now the team of these researchers, they have basically cemented what was suggested by Hubble Space Telescope. And what is the crux of this article? The discovery of ozone on Callisto suggests the presence of oxygen which in turn is a fundamental ingredient required in the formation of complex molecules required for life, such as amino acids. And this presence raises the questions about the moon's habitability, whether it can sustain life. That's what you need to understand from this topic. Let's look at another important topic, Prevention of Money Laundering Act a law that has lost its way, according to PDT Achari, who is the former Secretary General of Lok Sabha. What is money laundering? There was a time when 
there was a ban on alcohol in United States. There was prohibition in United States. And what these bootleggers would do, they would sell liquor in return for cash. They would get the money in cash. But what if the tax authorities will ask them, where did you get this cash from? You have no option. You have no reason to justify it. Then what these bootleggers did, they started opening laundry shops. Which basically means laundry shops were opened where the people will come, pay in cash to get their clothes cleaned. And if tomorrow tax authorities will ask you, where did you get this money from? You would say, we got this money from our laundry business. So that money which you raised by selling illicit drugs or by selling liquor or by selling other illegal things, you are laundering that money, cleaning that money by converting that money into cash or by converting that money into legitimate money. This is money laundering. And for that, there is an important law called Prevention of Money Laundering Act in India, which was enacted in the year 2002, although it was, uh, it was given force in 2006. An enforcement directorate, which is a department under the Department of Revenue under the Finance Ministry is responsible for implementing this law called PMLA. But what was the original intent of this law? The original intent was money which is generated through international drug trafficking which posed a threat to democracies of various countries. So you are selling drugs Obviously, it's an illegal thing, but there is an international element involved in it as well. What is the international element? For example, Taliban in Afghanistan, the Taliban government would justify uh, trading in uh, opium. Why? Because through that, it would generate a lot of money, which they can use for funding their activities. So there is cross-national, transnational involvement in drug syndicate. So drugs are sold in return for money, in return for cash, and this cash is unaccounted, so it affects the economy of the, of the particular country because you can't generate taxes from that. And in fact, it can be used to destabilize your country as well. And it can be used by foreign countries to destabilize other countries as well. So all this money which was generated through illegal transaction or trade in drugs this had to be regulated. And for that, what happened? United Nations took a very strong notice of this. And in 1988, it held United Nations Convention against illicit traffic in narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances. And all the countries were asked that you have to enact laws which will effectively curb this menace. In fact, some countries established in June 1989, seven industrial countries led by United States and others, although United States later had its own problems with FATF, established Financial Action Task Force to examine the problem of money laundering and to recommend measures. How can we prevent this menace? That is how even uh, some time ago, some months ago, the term of the ED directive was extended. Although the law was amended, which says that originally the term of the ED directive was two years. Now the amended law said it can be extended. It can be extended to, to five years as well, one year at a time. And that is how one ED director, who the opposition critics considered to be the uh, blue-eyed boy of the center, his term was extended again and again. The Supreme Court had to come down heavily and said, no, you can't extend this term beyond. The court asked the center, why are you extending his term? He said, sir, we are in the middle of the review by FATF. FATF conducts this review of these countries to ensure that these countries, their systems are in place. They can prevent money laundering in international drugs, psychotropic substances, illegal trade in drugs, illicit trade in drugs. Since we are in the middle of the inspection by FATF, that is why we need continuity in enforcement directorate. That is why we are extending the term of the ED director. The court said only this time, not beyond that. So you can't extend the term of the ED director. 
but be that as it may, the very purpose was what? To prevent the illicit trade in drugs and psychotropic substances. And that is how this bill, Prevention of Money Laundering Bill, when it was introduced in the parliament, it was introduced under Article 253 of the Constitution. What is Article 253? When India wants to give effect, shape to any international treaty or an agreement or a convention, the bill is introduced under Article 253. But that bill, which is introduced under Article 253, it has to subscribe to that subject matter only. It has to be confined to that subject matter. That means this Prevention of Money Laundering Act, it was originally enacted under Article 253 of the Constitution to deal with what? To deal with one specific problem, which is money laundering. Money laundering where? Due to illicit trade in drugs and psychotropic substances. But later on, this law was amended multiple times. Multiple times it was amended and its jurisdiction was widened. Widened in the sense, now under Prevention of Corruption Act, if you are guilty of money laundering, money laundering can happen in multiple sectors. But this law was specifically meant to prevent money laundering through illicit trade in drugs and, narco and psychotropic substances. And then through various amendments, this law was amended and its scope was widened. Now, even if under Prevention of Corruption Act, you are laundering money, it will come under Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Which PDT Achari says is not the real objective of this law because this objective had to be specific because it was a bill under Article 253. And what makes this law difficult is that there is something called presumption of guilt. The golden rule of criminal justice system is you are innocent until proven otherwise. That means whenever you are arrested for murder, for example, the courts will assume that you are innocent. It is for the prosecution to prove to the court that to beyond any reasonable doubt that you are guilty of murder. Only then you will be charged, you will be prosecuted. But the Prevention of Money Laundering Act is such where the presumption of guilt is on the accused. The accused is presumed to be guilty. And now it is for this accused to prove that he is not guilty. You have to prove, not the prosecution. And that is why bail is also very difficult, extremely difficult in Prevention of Money Laundering Act. For example, Section 45 of Prevention of Money Laundering Act, it talks about bail. It says bail can be given in Prevention of Money Laundering Act cases provided the judge is satisfied that you are innocent and the judge is satisfied that you will not repeat the offense. Can bail be given in this case? I am accused under Prevention of Money Laundering Act. I am asking for bail. What the court will assume, what the court will do? It gives wide discretion to the judge. If I believe that you are innocent, I will release you on bail. If I believe that you are innocent, when do I believe it? I don't believe it in, in it unless and until the entire case is over. Unless and until the entire case is tried. Because only after the trial starts, when arguments are given by both the parties, then I am convinced that you are not guilty. That means this is at the time of the judgment that the judge will decide whether you are guilty or not. How will judge know, even before trial, that you are innocent? Because the presumption of guilt is you are guilty. Now you have to prove that you are innocent. And you can prove only after the trial is over. That's what makes bail very difficult. And the judges will give the bail if the judge is satisfied that you will not repeat the offense. And no judge will take it in his own hands or her own hands to say that I am convinced, satisfied that you will not repeat this offense. That's why bail is extremely difficult in this case. 
In fact, whenever a case is registered, there is something called FIR, first information report about a particular case. Similar to the investigation by ED under PMLA, there is something called ECIR. The information report by the enforcement. FIR copy is given to the accused. ECIR copy is not given to the accused. But something else happened. The year was 2018. In Nikesh Tarachan Shah versus Union of India, a two judge bench of the Supreme Court, what it did? It said that this section 45 of the PMLA is unconstitutional. Why? Because way back in 1978, Justice V.R. Krishna Iyer had said, bail is the norm, jail is the exception. When you are giving too wide powers to the judges, that if you are satisfied that this person is innocent, you can release him on bail. Otherwise, keep him in jail. If you are satisfied that this person will not repeat the offense, then you can grant him jail. Otherwise, keep him in then you can grant him bail, otherwise keep him in jail. This is unconstitutional. But with great alacrity, very quickly, the parliament restored this provision, saying, no, no bail will be given. Bail will be given under Section 45. In fact, Enforcement Directorate can seize your assets, can confiscate your assets, can arrest you, Remember, ED is not a police, but it can still arrest you. There is something called proceeds of crime. That means through this money laundering, if you have bought an apartment or land or any other property, that is the proceeds of crime. ED can confiscate not only this proceeds of crime, ED can confiscate any other property, even if it's not directly from the proceeds of crime. This was challenged to the court. But Justice Khanvilkar, just a couple of days before his retirement, upheld these amendments. When these amendments were upheld, then a review petition, then a, another counter petition was filed in the Supreme Court. Justice Call was one of the judges who was hearing this matter, but the government kept delaying. Um, coming up with arguments on this case. The government kept up, kept on asking for more time. The Solicitor General kept on asking for more time. Why? Because according to critics, they did not want Sanjay Kishan Kohl, Justice Sanjay Kohl, to hear this matter because he seems to have made his mind that he will strike down this law, strike down these provisions of this law. Long story short, PMLA, which is often in the news, whether it is because of Mr. Kejriwal or others, or investigations against opposition leaders, whether it is Himan Soren of Jharkhand. PMLA is in the news, but what was the real objective of this law? Because this law was enacted under Article 253 and it had to be for one specific subject matter. And that subject matter was laundering of money through illicit trade in drugs and narcotrophic or psychotrophic substances. Narcotic drugs and psychotrophic substances. But because of various amendments to this law, the scope has been expanded. Now even a murder can be investigated by ED under PMLA if it leads to money laundering, which affects the police role, which affects federalism because police is under the state list in the distribution of powers. The law was expanded to, a, to allow corruption by public servant servants under the Prevention of Corruption Act. Such offences can also be investigated by ED under PMLA, which was not the original mandate of this law. That is why critics say that to make PMLA an effective law, because it is required to tackle illicit trade in narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances, we need to take this law back to its original purpose. And that original purpose has to be maintained. That's what you need to understand this law. This article, the PMLA, a law that has lost its way and we need to take it back to its original purpose. Let's look at another article, Ladakh's protest, a hunger for justice. 
Jammu and Kashmir, it had three regions. Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh. Ladakh itself has two regions. One is Leh, the other is Kargil. Leh is Buddhist dominated, Kargil is Muslim dominated. Why? I will tell you. The year was 2019. Jammu and Kashmir was reorganized. Jammu and Kashmir now is one union territory. And Ladakh is a union territory, but without a legislature. Jammu and Kashmir is a union territory which will have a legislative assembly once the elections are conducted. But Ladakh as a union territory will be without a legislative assembly. But the government of Jammu and Kashmir, way back in 1995, had recognized the unique geography and the problems of Ladakh, saying it's not, an, it's not just like any other region of Jammu and Kashmir state, it's completely different because of its topography, because of its geography, because of its resources. And that is how in 1995, this Ladakh was given an organization called Ladakh Autonomous Hill Development Council, where people were democratically elected to this council and they would govern Ladakh, the region of Ladakh called Ladakh Autonomous Hill Development Council. But once Jammu and Kashmir was bifurcated, Ladakh was given a UT status without a legislature. Now there are states, now there are people demanding something. And what are these people demanding? They are demanding that we should be given statehood. Some in lay, they want a completely, a complete statehood. Some in Kargil, they say, we want to go back to Kashmir. We want to go back and merge with Jammu and Kashmir. We should be one common unit. Sonam Wangchuk, the man who inspired three idiots, or one such character was of three idiots. He's also, he was also on the hunger strike. Why? He wanted Ladakh to be included in the sixth schedule of the constitution. What will happen because of the sixth schedule? There are 10 districts in India, in states such as Assam, Meghalaya, Mizoram, and Tripura, which come under sixth schedule of the constitution. And because of the sixth schedule, what happens? District councils are created. To these district councils, elections are conducted. People are directly elected to these district councils. And then these district councils can make laws, can implement laws, can even decide on disputes among the people. That sort of autonomy is provided to these areas under sixth schedule. Ladakh says today, in fact, there are two organizations. One is Leh Apex Body. The other is Kargil Democratic Alliance. Both have decided to join hands. And together, they are asking for statehood and inclusion of Ladakh not just any other state, inclusion of Ladakh in sixth schedule so that we can protect our land. How to protect their land? Because as part of Jammu and Kashmir, Ladakh also had a provision because it was provision for the entire state that outsiders cannot buy land in Jammu and Kashmir, cannot buy property in Jammu and Kashmir, cannot get jobs in Jammu and Kashmir cannot get scholarships in Jammu and Kashmir. So that protection was available to Ladakh as well. Now when Ladakh is taken away from JNK, that special status of JNK is also gone. Ladakh is now a union territory without a legislature. So who takes the decision? A lieutenant, an administrator who is appointed by the center. In fact, even this Ladakh Autonomous Hill Development Council, it is now powerless. Because although land, whether it is to be leased, that decision is taken by Ladakh Autonomous Hill Development Council. But there were rules issued in 2023, the draft industrial, Ladakh industrial land allotment policy, because this land should be given to industrial use. 
there are people in Ladakh who are saying ours is a very fragile environment, very fragile ecology. What happened in Sikkim, what happened in Uttarakhand should not happen with us. We are over flooded with tourists. Yes, we need tourism, but we need sustainable tourism. There is unchecked tourism right now. In fact, there was a survey conducted which said a tourist is using 100 liters of water in a day. While as the locals, they only get 25 to, 20, 25 to 35 liters a day. Which means if you need more water to meet the flooding of Ladakh by tourists, that is going to drain the groundwater and that is contaminating groundwater. So they need tourism but sustainable tourism. Otherwise, what happened in Uttarakhand, in Sikkim, might happen in Ladakh as well. And there were flash floods in Ladakh as well because of the melting of the glaciers some time ago. These Ladakhis are saying that we have lost our grazing land to China. The government is not accepting that. But the Ladakhis say, we used to reach those lands for grazing purposes. But now those lands are occupied by China. So we have lost our land to China we are losing our environment to, to tourists and we don't have protection of our land, our jobs. That is why they are demanding a special status under 6th schedule of the constitution. What are the key demands? What are the main pressures on local resources? That is what you need to understand from this article. Ladakh's protest, a hunger for justice. Let's look at another important topic relevant for prelims, Iran's persecution of Baha'i minority constitutes crime against humanity. Says who? Human Rights Watch. What is Human Rights Watch? It's basically an international non-governmental organization which investigates and comments on the abuses anywhere in the world. That's Human Rights Watch. But this Human Rights Watch, it was founded as a private non-governmental organization in United States in 1978. And initially, it was given a name Helsinki Watch. Why? To see whether Soviet Union is abiding by Helsinki Accord or not. What is this Helsinki Accord? The year was 1975. Helsinki Accord was signed. Between whom? Between East and West. Who are these countries in the East? These are the countries who basically were the communist countries. Who are these countries in the West? Those who are basically the allies of the United States of America. Because after the Second World War, the world became bipolar. Two superpowers emerged, United States and USSR. In fact, majority of the countries in the world, they allied with either of the two blocs. And this is where the Cold War also started. But then in 1975, Helsinki Accord was signed between the countries in the East and the countries in the West, basically the communist countries and those who are the allies of the United States to ensure that we will respect each other's sovereignty. To ensure that we will not threaten war and we will not resort to war between each other. But this award, this accord was not binding because no signature was taken. It was not binding on all any of the countries. But the human, this Helsinki watch was set up as a private NGO in, in uh, America in 1978. Why? To see whether Soviet Union is abiding, is complying with these Helsinki accords or not. So Helsinki watch to watch USSR, Soviet Union, whether it is complying with the Helsinki accord. Then few years later, in 1981, America's watch was founded. That means an organization which will watch what? The civil war which was engulfing Central America. It conducted investigative reports, investigations into abuses by 
people, by rebels. In fact, even criticized United States for how they are investigated the role of the United States in providing weapons to the rebels who are causing abuse in Central America. So keep a watch on Central America, America Watch. Similarly then, other watch committees were set up. One to take a look at Asia, Asia Watch. Another to look at Africa, Africa Watch. Another to look at Middle East, Middle East Watch. And in 1988, these committees were clubbed together. They got united under the name and that name is Human Rights Watch. And Human Rights Watch has said that the persecution of the Baha'i community in Iran is crime against humanity. And particularly, they have been criminalized, they have been dehumanized after the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979. That is what you need to understand regarding Human Rights Watch. Now, two questions for your mains preparation. And if you have understood today's discussion, if you have liked today's discussion, do not forget to press the like button, drop in your comments, subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet, and share the links of these classes with your friends and fellow aspirants. Two questions for mains. Number one, the original focus of PMLA was on the prevention of money from the laundering of drugs. However, the law has acquired a different character through amendments from time to time. The alleged misuse of the law can be eradicated if the law goes back to its original intent. And what is the intent? The intent is to prevent the laundering of money through illicit trade in narcotic drugs and psychotropic, psychotropic substances. Question number two, what is fiscal federalism? Does the imposition of borrowing limits on the states by the center violate federalism? These are the questions for your practice for mains examination. Thank you so much for staying with me. Hope to see you soon again with another edition of the Hindu newspaper. Till then, have a great time. All the best. Bye-bye.